Property can be an amazing way to invest your money. It can give you financial freedom and passive income and set you up for life. Or it can become a nightmare that sucks all your energy and your time and actually costs you money. And one of the key differences between these two scenarios is understanding one thing very well, tax. So today I'm gonna to talk you through six tricks that can help you dramatically reduce your tax bill in 2024 and make sure your deals are as profitable as possible. But in order to do that, first, we need to understand how property tax actually works. So to do that, let's use the example of Andy. Let's pretend Andy makes £70,000 a year in his day job and he's got this great idea to buy a house and rent it out for a profit of £1,000 per month. So he starts renting it out and at the end of the year, the tax man runs their calculation and they see that on top of his £70,000, he's also made £12,000 in rental profit. In other words, his new taxable income is £82,000. Well, on the surface, that sounds like a good thing, but when you dig into the figures, it gets quite scary. Tax works a little bit like a champagne fountain. When you start pouring champagne into the fountain, everything lands in the first glass. But at some point, you pour so much champagne that it starts to spread down to different levels. And by the time you poured in the whole bottle, you'll have different amounts of champagne sitting at each level. And your tax works in a similar but far less fun way. When you first start making money, everything's poured into the first bracket, which is taxed at 0%. However, once you hit the 12,570 pound limit of this bracket, it starts pouring into the next one where you get taxed at 20%. And this continues until you reach the final bracket where you pay a whopping 45% in tax. So yes, Andy might have made an additional £12,000, but all of it will land in the 40% bucket, which cuts his profit almost in half. So if you're in a similar situation, what can you do about this? Well, I've got six tips coming up, but first, a quick reminder that while I've had all this information checked by a qualified tax advisor, I'm not one. This is all just general information that can't apply to everyone and misses out on a lot of complexity to stop you switching off. So as I mentioned a few times, you really must work with a qualified expert to figure out what's right for your situation. So let's continue with the same example and imagine that Andy has a wife called Amy and they decide to buy the house together. They buy it from their joint account. So in theory, they each own half the house and the rental income should get split 50-50, right? Well, not necessarily. Amy's day job pays her 30,000 pounds a year. So her total earnings, even with the rental income, are not enough to fill up the second bucket, meaning she only pays a top rate of 20% of tax. So rather than split the house down the middle, they go 99-1. Amy takes 99% ownership of the house and Andy gets a downstairs loop, figuratively speaking. So why is this helpful? Splitting things this way means that the rental income is also divided up in proportion to their beneficial ownership, meaning Amy takes home 99% of the rental profit. And even with 99% ownership, her total taxable income remains comfortably within the 20% bracket. And as Amy's husband, Andy enjoys all the extra money anyway, provided they have a trusting relationship. But what if you don't have an Amy? What other tactics can you use to keep more of your hard-earned money? Well, let's look at the house you've got your eye on. Imagine it's a big apartment in an upscale part of town where the average rent is quite high. Because of the location and the type of property, tenants will expect it to be fully furnished. And normally the cost of that furniture isn't something you can claim as an expense against your rental income. But if the property could be used as a furnished holiday let, then you can use something called capital allowances to write off the full cost of the furniture over a number of years, which could reduce or eliminate your rental profit. But that isn't the only perk to doing holiday lets. Because it's classified as a trading business rather than an investment, you can also claim various reliefs to reduce your capital gains tax when you sell. And you can claim the entirety of your mortgage interest as an expense, even if you own the property as an individual, which as we'll see, isn't always the case. That said, holiday lets are a specialist business model, which won't suit everyone. So you wouldn't go down this route for the tax benefits alone, tempting though that may be. But there is something far easier that everyone can do to pay less tax. Some expenses you'll incur as a property investor are all too obvious. When there's a boiler to repair or a big service charge bill, you're definitely going to notice it, maybe have a little cry about it, and then claim it as a cost that reduces your taxable profit. But there are probably other expenses you're not claiming, which means you're paying more tax than you need to. For example, you can claim your mileage costs when you're driving to be properties. You can claim the cost of any training courses you take to improve your skills. And if you're working from home, which most of us probably are, you can even claim a proportion of your home bills. You can brush up on your own knowledge, but it's probably better to use a good accountant who's aware of everything you can claim and check to make sure you're not missing anything. Claiming everything you're entitled to is an easy win anyone can do, but there's something more fundamental that has huge tax advantages. 
and that is buying the property through a company, which has two big benefits. The first is that companies pay tax on profits at a rate that never exceeds 25%. So it's like a bottomless champagne bucket rather than a fountain. However much you pour in, you never get up to the 45% brackets that individuals reach. And the second is that companies can claim all their mortgage interest costs as an expense, whereas individuals can't. This means that a company will show a lower profit because it's able to offset more expenses. And of course, that's then less profit to pay tax on. And if you do end up with your property in a company, you can take things a step further to really empty that bucket as much as possible to pay next to no tax at all. Like any company, yours has employees too, even if that's just one person, you. And as an employee, you're entitled to receive pension contributions. So let's say after deducting all costs, your company makes £12,000 in profit. Normally, it would need to pay corporation tax on that £12,000. But a company can make pension contributions of up to £60,000 per year for each director. So if you pay yourself £12,000 in pension contributions, as long as you've personally earned at least £12,000 in the year to make this an allowable move, then essentially the company has zero profit and no profit means no tax. Now this might sound too good to be true and it kind of is. There is a catch. That £12,000 will then be locked up in your pension fund meaning you won't be able to spend it until you retire, which could be a good 20 or more years down the road. So if you plan on using that money to buy another property or to cover your daily expenses, although it will dramatically reduce your tax bill, it might not be very practical. But this next tip could be. Let's stick with the same example as before and say that you've made £12,000 of profit by the end of the year. So rather than getting hit with a big tax bill, you decide to reinvest back into your property and spend £12,000 on a new bathroom and kitchen. Which means in theory, you'll have no taxable income unless you make this classic mistake. You need to understand the difference between a repair, known as a revenue cost, and an improvement, known as a capital cost. Why? Because repairs are deductible against rental profits, which is what you want. Whereas improvements can only be offset against capital gains tax when you sell, which could be many years into the future. For example, HMRC sees installing solar panels or adding a third bedroom as a significant capital enhancement to the existing facilities and therefore an improvement. So while they might increase the rent you receive, you can't offset those costs against your profit. However, you can make significant upgrades while still staying within the realms of repairs. For example, replacing a dated kitchen and bathroom suite might also allow you to charge more rent and could even lift the value of the property. But because you're replacing like with like in terms of facilities, it's still a repair. That means work like this could reduce or eliminate your tax bill or even generate losses to carry forward against future year's tax. This applies to refurbishment when you buy properties too, but critically, the property must have been rentable in its original state. If the work was necessary to attract tenants in the first place, the work would be treated like the purchase price and only be claimable in future against capital gains tax. So it's important to check your plans with an expert and gather any evidence you might need if you're challenged by the tax man in future. You'll also need to keep hold of receipts for materials and invoices from tradespeople. And if there's an element of both repairs and upgrade in a particular project, as there often is, ideally allow them to split out their invoices so it's easier to claim. But remember, the idea with tax is to understand it, not to become obsessed with reducing it. So while it might make sense to spend £12,000 to increase the value of your property or to reduce your company's tax bill, it won't be if your primary objective is to make passive income you can spend today or to generate profits that can be invested back into buying more properties. So whatever you do, always keep your personal goals in mind. And the same is true for buying property via a company. While I've talked about the tax benefits it offers, there's a serious risk of hearing the advantages and plowing blindly into it, only to find out later it's not the right move at which point it's horribly expensive to make a change. So before you run off and start coming up with a cool company name to register at a company's house, watch this video next, where I break down the pros and cons of buying as an individual and as a company, so you can work out the best solution for you personally.